Lane. Chapter Ten, Morning Service in the Minster. The cathedral is the glory of Beorminster, of the county, and indeed of all England, since no churches surpass it in size and splendor save the minsters of York and Canterbury. Founded and endowed by Henry the Second in eleven eighty four for the glory of God, it is dedicated to the blessed St. Wolf of Osserton, a holy hermit of Saxon times, who was killed by the heathen Danes. Bishop Gandalf designed the building in the picturesque style of Anglo-Norman architecture, and as the original plans have been closely adhered to by successive prelates, the vast fabric is the finest example extant of the Norman superiority in architectural science. It was begun by Gandalf in 1185, and finished at the beginning of the present century. Therefore, as it took six hundred years in building, every portion of it is executed in the most perfect manner. It is renowned both for its beauty and sanctity, and forms one of the most splendid memorials of architectural art and earnest faith to be found even in England, that land of fine churches. The great central tower rises to the height of two hundred feet in square massiveness, and from this point springs a slender and graceful spire to another hundred feet, so that next to Salisbury, the great archetype of this special class of ecclesiastical architecture, it is the tallest spire in England. Two square towers, richly ornamented, embellish the western front, and beneath the great window over the central entrance is a series of canopied arches. The church is cruciform in shape, and is built of Portland stone, the whole being richly ornamented with pinnacles, buttresses, crocketed spires, and elaborate tracery. Statues of saints, kings, queens, and bishops are placed in niches along the northern and southern fronts, and the western front itself is sculptured with scenes from Holy Scripture in the quaint, grotesque style of medieval art. No ivy is permitted to conceal the beauties of the building, and elevated in the clear air, far above the smoke of the town, it looks as fresh and white and clean-cut as though it had been erected only within the last few years. Spared by Henry the Eighth and the iconoclastic rage of the Puritans, time alone has dealt with it and time has mellowed the whole to a pale amber hue which adds greatly to the beauty of the mighty fane. Burminster Cathedral is a poem in stone. Within, the nave and transepts are lofty and imposing, with innumerable arches springing from massive marble pillars. The rude screen is ornate, with figures of saints and patriarchs, the pavement is diversified with brasses and carved marble slabs, and several crusaders' tombs adorn the side chapels. The many windows are mostly of stained glass, since these were not destroyed by the Puritans, and when the sun shines on a summer's day, the twilight interior is dyed with rich hues and quaint patterns. As the Bishop of Burminster is a high churchman, the altar is magnificently decorated, and during service, what with the light and color and brilliancy, the vast building seems, unlike the dead aspect of many of its kind, to be filled with life and movement and living faith. A Romanist might well imagine that he was attending one of the magnificent and imposing services of his own faith, save that the uttered words are spoken in the mother tongue. As became a city whose whole existence depended upon the central shrine, the services at the cathedral were invariably well attended. The preaching attracted some, the fine music many, and the imposing ritual introduced by Bishop Pendle went a great way towards bringing worshippers to the altar. 
a cold frigid undecorated service appealing more to the intellect than the senses would not have drawn together so vast and attentive a congregation but the warmth and colour and musical fervour of the new ritual lured the most careless within the walls of the sacred building bishop pendle was right in his estimate of human nature for when the senses are enthralled by colour and sound and vast spaces and symbolic decorations the reverential feeling thus engendered prepares the mind for the reception of the sublime truths of christianity a pure faith and a gorgeous ritual are not so incompatible as many people think god should be worshipped with pomp and splendour we should bring to his service all that we can invent in the way of art and beauty if god has prepared for those who believe the splendid habitation of the new jerusalem with its gates of pearl and its streets of gold why should we his creatures stint our gifts in his service and debar the beautiful things which he inspires us to create with brain and hand from use in his holy temple out of the fullness of the heart the mouth speaketh and out of the fullness of the hand the giver should give date et dabitur the great luther was right in applying this saying to the church one of the congregation at st wolf's on this particular morning was captain george pendle and he came less for the service than in the hope after the manner of those in love of meeting with mab arden during the reading of the lessons his eyes were roving here and there in search of that beloved face but much to his dismay he could not see it finally on a chair near a pillar he caught sight of miss whichello in her poke bonnet and black silk cloak but she was alone and there were no bright eyes beside her to send a glance in the direction of george having ascertained beyond all doubt that mab was not in the church and believing that she was unwell after the shock of jentham's attack on the previous night george withdrew his attention from the congregation and settled himself to listen attentively to the anthem it was worthy of the cathedral and higher praise cannot be given i have blotted out as a thick cloud sang the boy soloist in a clear sweet treble i have blotted out thy transgressions and as a cloud thy sins then came the triumphant cry of the choir borne on the rich waves of sound rolling from the organ return unto me for i have redeemed thee the lofty roof reverberated with the melodious thunder and the silvery altos pierced through the great volume of sound like arrows of song return 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 called the choristers louder and higher and clearer and ended with a magnificent burst of harmony with the sublime proclamation the lord hath redeemed jacob and glorified himself in israel when the white-robed singers resumed their seats the organ still continued to peal forth triumphant notes which died away in gentle murmurs it was like the passing by of a tempest the stilling of the ocean after a storm mr cargram preached the sermon and with a vivid recollection of his present enterprise waxed eloquent on the ominous text be sure thy sin will find thee out his belief that the bishop was guilty of some crime for the concealment of which he intended to bribe jentham had been strengthened by an examination on that very morning of the cheque-book dr pendle had departed on horseback for southbury after an early breakfast and after hurriedly dispatching his own cargren had hastened to the library here as he expected he found the cheque-book carelessly left in an unlocked drawer of the desk 
and on looking over it he found that one of the butts had been torn out the previous butt bore a date immediately preceding that of dr pendle's departure for london so cargrim had little difficulty in concluding that the bishop had drawn the next cheque in london and had torn out the butt to which it had been attached this showed as the chaplain very truly thought that dr pendle was desirous of concealing not only the amount of the cheque since he had kept no note of the sum on the butt but of hiding the fact that the cheque had been drawn at all this conduct coupled with the fact of jentham's allusion to tom tiddler's ground and his snatch of extempore song confirmed cargrim in his suspicions that pendle had visited london for the purpose of drawing out a large sum of money and intended to pay the same over to jentham that very night on southbury heath with this in his mind it was no wonder that cargrim preached a stirring sermon he repeated his warning text over and over again he illustrated it in the most brilliant fashion and his appeals to those who had secret sins to confess them at once were quite heart-rending in their pathos as most of his congregation had their own little peccadilloes to worry over mr cargrim's sermon made them quite uneasy and created a decided sensation much to his own gratification if bishop pendle had only been seated on his throne to hear that sermon cargrim would have been thoroughly satisfied but alas the bishop worthy man was confirming innocent sinners at southbury and thus lost any chance he might have had of profiting by his chaplain's eloquence however the congregation could not be supposed to know the secret source of the chaplain's eloquence and his withering denunciations were supposed to arise from a consciousness of his own pure and open heart the female admirers of cargrim particularly dwelt in after-church gossip on this presumed cause of the excellent sermon they had heard and when the preacher appeared he was congratulated on all sides miss tancred for once forgot her purse story and absolutely squeaked in the highest of keys in her efforts to make the young man understand the amount of pleasure he had given her even mrs pansey was pleased to express her approval of so well chosen a text and looked significantly at several of her friends as she remarked that she hoped they would take its warning to heart george came upon his father's chaplain grinning like a heathen idol in the midst of a tempestuous ocean of petticoats and the bland way in which he sniffed up the incense of praise showed how grateful such homage was to his vain nature at that moment he saw himself a future bishop and that at no very great distance of time indeed had the election of such a prelate been in the hand of his admirers he would have been elevated that very moment to the nearest vacant episcopalian throne captain pendle looked on contemptuously at this priest-worship the sneaking cad he thought sneering at the excellent cargrim i dare say he thinks he is the greatest man in Burminster just now he looks as though butter wouldn't melt in his mouth there was no love lost between the chaplain and the captain for on several occasions the latter had found cargrim a slippery customer and lax in his notions of honour while the curate knowing that he had not been clever enough to hoodwink george hated him with all the fervour and malice of his petty soul however he hoped soon to have the power to wound captain pendle through his father so he could afford to smile blandly in response to the young soldier's contemptuous look and he smiled more than ever when brisk miss whichello with her small face ruddy as a winter apple marched up and joined in the congratulations 
"'In future I shall call you Bornerges, Mr. Cargram,' she cried, her bright little eyes dancing. "'You quite frightened me. I looked into my mind to see what sins I had committed.' "'And found none, I'm sure,' said the courtly chaplain. "'You would have found one if you had looked long enough,' growled Mrs. Pansy, who hated the old maid as a rival practitioner amongst the poor and that is, you did not bring your niece to hear the sermon. I don't call such carelessness Christianity. Don't look at my sins through a microscope, Mrs. Pansy. I did not bring Mab because she is not well. Oh, really, dear Miss Winchelow, chimed in Daisy Norsham. Why, I thought that your sweet niece looked the very picture of health. All those strong, tall women do, not like poor little me. "'You need dieting,' retorted Miss Whichello, with a disparaging glance. "'Your face is pale and pasty. If it isn't powder, it's bad digestion.' "'Miss Whichello!' cried the outraged spinster. "'I'm an old woman, my dear, and you must allow me to speak my mind. I'm sure Mrs. Pansy always does.' "'You need not be so very unpleasant. No, really.' the truth is always unpleasant said mrs pansy who could not forbear a thrust even at her own guest but miss whichello doesn't often hear it with a dig at her rival come away daisy mr cargram next time you preach take for your text the tongue is a two-edged sword do mr cargram cried miss whichello darting an angry glance at mrs pansy and illustrate it with the one to whom it particularly applies. "'Ladies, ladies!' remonstrated Cargram, while both combatants ruffled their plumes like two fighting cocks, and the more timid of the spectators scuttled out of the way. How the situation would have ended it is impossible to say, as the two ladies were equally matched but george saved it by advancing to greet miss whichello when the little woman saw him she darted forward and shook his hand with unfeigned warmth my dear captain pendle she cried i am so glad to see you and thank you for your noble conduct of last night why miss whichello it was nothing murmured the modest hero indeed i must say it was very valiant said cargram graciously do you know ladies that miss arden was attacked last night by a tramp and captain pendle knocked him down oh really how very sweet cried daisy casting an admiring look at george's handsome face which appealed to her appreciation of manly beauty what was miss arden doing to place herself in the position of being attacked by a tramp asked mrs pansy in a hard voice this must be looked into thank you mrs pansy i have looked into it myself said miss whichello captain pendle come home with me to luncheon and tell me about it mr cargram you come also both gentlemen bowed and accepted the former because he wished to see mab the latter because he knew that captain pendle did not want him to come as miss whichello moved off with her two guests mrs pansy exclaimed in a loud voice poor young men luncheon indeed they will be starved i know for a fact that she weighs out the food in scales then having had the last word she went home in triumph end of chapter ten